just a quick introduction as always to Stat Central. Um, you can probably see the slides that have been going past um, over time, but just to reiterate, I guess, uh, we provide statistical consultations for UNSW researchers. Um, so for staff, we can provide design advice and for HDR students, uh, design analysis and communication help with your stats. Um, with smaller questions related to coding, we have a representative who um, drops into UNSW coders and the ResTech drop-in sessions, which are on Wednesdays. Um, we also provide grant review uh, and advice, uh, and we, we do some short courses. The next one, which is up right now, uh, is actually next week from Monday to Thursday, and there's still time to register if you're interested in regression. Um, and finally, we also do monthly seminars, which is what we're here for today. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Eve Slavich, who's going to talk to us about initial data analysis. Thank you. Uh, just uh, get uh, my slides up. Uh, and... Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Mark, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, <laughs> online and in person. Um, so, yeah, so I this talk is about initial data analysis, uh, which uh, I've called the missing link in statistical analysis plans. Um, I don't know if it's really missing. You can tell me if that's true, but it's my impression. Um, so uh, when we do research that involves data, we, we start with our research question, the thing that we're dying to know the answer to. Um, we have, and, we, and we think up uh, some analysis, some inference that's going to give us um, the answer to our research question. Uh, and so our inference is, is closely targeted at our research question, which we have um, ideally first. Um, but there's all this stuff that comes in the middle. Uh, so after we do our research, after we have our research question, we design our study, uh, come up with a plan, collect some data, set up some metadata, do some cleaning and screening of the data. Uh, we might look to see if we have missing data and what we have to do about that. We might do transformations. We might look at outliers. Uh, we might check model assumptions. And it's really only then, and only then that we get to uh, look at the answer to our research question, which is the thing that we're dying to know the answer to. So what I'm calling initial data analysis is really all the analysis, which is not the analysis that answers your research question. Uh, but what we often see is uh, a road to inference that looks a bit more like this, uh, where we um, start with our study design and then we collect our data and then we are dying to know the answer to the question. <laughs> so we go and do our inference um, straight away because we're excited um, and we forget about the initial data analysis. And we know we have to do it. We, we kind of go back to it. Um, this is another um, diagram to illustrate the research process that's a bit different to mine that I've taken from this paper, uh, but it's pretty much the same idea. You go from a uh, collection of data to um, initial data analysis, data cleaning, data screening, initial data analysis reporting, and then you might update your analysis plan, and then you do your statistical analyses, and then you write your research article. Um, so, one of my take home messages today is to hold your horses and do the initial data analysis 
before your inference. Uh, so it will save you lots of time and it's good science. So what you ideally wanna do is do all your initial data analysis before as much as possible without touching your research question. And then when you know that's all, um, all nice and uh, tidy, then you can look at your research question. And then that part of the analysis is usually really quick. So initial data analysis might take 50 to 80% of your time actually. And it's not the fun stuff, uh, but it is important. Uh, so here's an example of uh, why it's a good idea to just do it um, properly. Like you do your data collection and then you're so excited to go and fit your model that you plan to fit. Um, and you spend some time interpreting it, thinking about it. And then you realize, oh no, there's duplicates in there. I didn't clean the data properly. So you go back, do that. And you fit your model again and you're thinking about the answer. And then, ah, oh, the results are weird. And ah, oh, those observations aren't meant to be in the data set because they're, they're exclusions. And so go back, do some more inference. Uh, and then, ah, oh, no, the software's just been deleting all the cases that have missing data, but that's probably not the right thing to do. So that generates a whole nother um, can of worms doing some missing data um, uh, methods to count for your missing data. Go back to your inference. Uh, finally, something else comes up and then, and then finally you've got the answer to your research question. This is gonna send you bananas <laughs> so, because uh, you're just gonna um, be interpreting your research question and coming up with your your narrative, like what, what's, what the answer is uh, again and again. And it's ultimately, you'll start to question whether the decisions you're making are objective and, and you probably should because um, they may not be once you've seen the answer to your research question multiple times under multiple different um, decisions that you could have made. So, Let's turn the bananas into banana cake because your inference is going to be a piece of cake once you've done your initial data analysis properly. <laughs> Sorry for the corny jokes. Um, so um, my next uh, take home uh, message is that uh, I would like you to formally state the steps constituting uh, your initial data analysis in the initial, in the analysis plan that you should formulate when you design your study. Um, and, or at any point that you form an analysis plan, add in initial data analysis to that um, analysis plan. Um, and this is hard and uh, I'm giving this seminar because as a stats consultant, Often um, I come in and uh, often we don't focus a lot on some of the initial data analysis in a short time because we're thinking about the complex, what model you might need at the end. But I think that um, often where all the nitty gritty um, science happens is it can be in the initial data analysis. Um, so let's just go through the, some of the steps that you might do. Um, metadata creation. Uh, this is just describing the data. Um, so people have described it as asking who, what, where, why, and how of your data. Um, it's important so that your data can be reconstructed by someone else um, and uh, it helps to make the data reusable and be able to analyze, be analyzed again. Um, so I think um, don't sell yourself short and think that your study is small and no one is ever going to look at the data again. Um, you don't know that and it might be combined with other data in the future. 
if there's good metadata available. And it's just something like this. Um, like it tells you what type that it's numeric, what it is, um, it's a standardized score, what values are a reasonable value for that variable, precision, any assumptions. Um, and I, I put in that 100 here for this variable, it's a standardized test score and 100 is the highest level of achievement because you might have data that's like a Likert scale that's just one, two, three, four, five and uh, the metadata should contain the information like is five strongly agree or strongly disagree because it makes a big difference. Uh, so then you might do some data cleaning. Um, so data cleaning is just correcting errors, uh, looking for typos, mistakes and inconsistencies. Um, so particularly when you've combined data from multiple sources, they might be formatted in different fo formats in the same column. Um, dates, always look at your date variables. Uh, uh, and uh, just standardizing variables, um, you know, making sure categorical variables are all in the same case and things like that. Uh, and uh, looking for duplicates. This is particularly important if you've joined data sets um, that you can um, accidentally easily create um, duplicate rows uh, and check how your missing values are recorded. So, and then I guess like uh, the next phase is um, data screening. So data cleaning is just tidying things up a bit. Um, uh, data screening is really exploring and getting to know your data without touching the research question. So um, yeah, so one of the aims is to identify errors. Um, and then the other big aim is to check whether your intended analysis is uh, going to be, um, is, is fine or whether you're gonna have to make some changes to it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you might find missing data and realize you're gonna to have to do a missing uh, a multiple imputation and then fit your model on the imputed data um, and pull the results instead of just fitting the mo model, for example. Um, that might be one change that you have to make. Uh, so one thing you might start by doing is just calculating the descriptive uh, statistics um, of all the variables that you have and, uh, and, um, and plotting them, uh, identify their distributions, identify if you have variables that have no variation um, because they're um, ultimately useless. Uh, so by no variation, I mean, if it, all the ages of the people in your data set are 16, age is, is not uh, a relevant variable for the data analysis. It, it might be relevant in your study, but not it's not one of the varying variables. <laughs> uh, uh, and then um, you might do these things that I'm going to talk about now, transformations, missingness, uh, outliers and influential points. Um, so all of this screening uh, is like a double check of the, the cleaning. So um, here's just some nice plots uh, that I found generated in this R package, but uh, there, there's many ways to screen for missing data. Um, I, I like to do it visually. Um, I think it, it can um, help you discover new things about your data. Uh, so this um, uh, left plot is just showing which variables have uh, missing um, values. And you see it's just these two variables, ozone and solar. 
uh, and then um, uh, which observations are missing. And you can kind of get a sense for whether ozone and solar are missing together or they're just missing for different reasons. And here it looks like they're missing for different reasons. Um, uh, in the right hand side data set, uh, you can see it's the same kind of plot sort of, but um, you can see that um, some variables are missing together, um, like a whole chunk of years they're missing and then they start to become available in the more recent years. Um, and that definitely affects the questions that you'll be able to ask of this data. Um, and so you need to know about this um, uh, before you do your inference. Uh, and this, um, this, very, this middle plot is trying to look at the patterns of missingness, like um, it, you can see that oh, um, these missing values of ozone, they have the full range of solar um, values. So they're not, so it seems like there's no um, pattern where the missing values of ozone might all be small values of solar, it looks like solar is kind of maybe missing at random. Um, and it also looks like we might be able to use ozone to help us impute the values of solar. Um, and yeah, so that's gonna be part of our plan. So if you have a missing data, you, you wanna put missing, what you're gonna do with your missing data about your missing data into your initial data analysis plan. Um, and there's heaps of stuff you can do. This is a whole topic. Um, so I'm just gonna say multiple imputation um, and there's heaps of sub methods of that, um, but that's like um, uh, get, guessing the values um, smartly using the rest of your data um, and doing it lots of times uh, and then averaging across when you get your results. Uh, you could do complete case analysis. So you could just delete the observations with missing values. And sometimes you can do that. Um, so you could have a plan that if you have less than a percent missing data and you've got no reason to think that it's um, missing not at random, that you'll just uh, delete that and not worry about it because it's a very small fraction. Um, and then if it's more than that, you might um, use a different method. Um, there's also model-based methods. Uh, so, um, sorry, uh, just try and hide that. Um, I don't know how to hide that for you guys. Um, who are in the room. Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, there's in the room, the Zoom thing is covering the title of this slide. Uh, screening uh, for outliers is another thing you can do as part of your initial data analysis. Um, so you can do this before you fit your model uh, and uh, you might plot the data or calculate um, uh, some summary statistics as well. Uh, uh, and um, one thing that's been suggested is that you um, look for values that are outside of three mean absolute deviations of the median. Um, so, uh, and, and if you find values like this, you think of them as um, univariate outliers for that variable. And then you start to ask questions. Is it a data error? Um, first, you should try to fix it. Um, if I like, go back to the source data and see if you can um, fix it up. Um, and if you can't fix it, uh, if you decided it's a data error, then you have to delete it. Um, is it a sampling error? Like, did you sample 
an observation from the wrong population, like not your population of interest. Uh, so I just said, maybe you're looking at traffic and it was a public holiday Monday and um, you're not interested in public holiday traffic. Um, so you just delete it because that's the, not the period of interest that you're looking at. Um, uh, if it's an outlier under certain distribution, distributional assumptions, you might be able to transform the variable. So in this example here, I've got this outlier um, and I did a QQ plot. And what you can see is that all of this data is normal, except for this one point. Um, and so if I log transformed that variable, um, it's not going to deal with um, the outlier problem. Um, but sometimes you might have a skewed variable that's created the outlier and then you can just log the variable and you don't have outliers anymore. Uh, you can also screen for multivariate outliers amongst your predictor variables. So um, that's where you look uh, in more than one dimension at the values of the, um, the variables. So here I've got two dimensions in the plot, rainfall and uh, temperature. And you can see there's one um, observation that's got an unusual, um, it, that's unusual compared to the rest of the points. Um, so Mahalanobis distance is a uh, typical classical metric for um, uh, class, uh, calc defining how far a point is from a distribution. Um, it's good when you have um, normally distributed variables um, and not too many of them. Um, apparently doesn't do well if you have a high dimensional space, um, but there is, um, quite a bit of literature on multivariate outliers um, and MV outlier in R has a suite of other methods. Uh, so that's something you can do. So now we're kind of looking in our predictor variables. I would probably avoid generating this plot with your response variables and your predictor variables because um, that's something different. Um, because the outlying values of the predictor variables, the thing that's important about them is that um, they can have high leverage on regression coefficients. So what I mean by that is that a small change in the um, response variable value for this observation can result in large changes in the regression coefficients. So in this plot here, I've got this slope through the lines. And I've got two slopes, you can't really see them, but there's a black slope and a red slope. Um, this is a sketch, um, but they're approximately the same when I've included the black uh, point or not included the black point. But this um, point um, still has high leverage because if the value of the point changed, um, it could dramatically change the slope. Uh, whereas the values of the other points won't change the slope as much. Uh, so when the slope changes a lot, uh, the observation is called a high influence point. So high leverage points have the potential to be high influence points. Um, they're not necessarily. Um, so high influence means that if we removed this observation, we would get a large change in our regression coefficients. Um, but if we removed this point, we actually wouldn't get a large change. So in this data set, the black point is not a high leverage, sorry, a high influence point, but in this data set, it would be. And you can only check for influence after you touch your research question, but you can check leverage um, before you touch your research research question. Uh, so um, what should you do with your legitimate outliers um, in your response variable? You should have a plan prior to looking at your research question. 
um, and you should put this in your analysis plan. Uh, you can um, keep them or remove them. I'm generally not a fan of removing outliers in the response variable uh, because you're reducing the variance of your uh, response. This can lead to um, inflating your type one error rate, uh, but it depends on the purpose of your, it depends on your research question. Sometimes uh, there, there's a case for it. Um, so if yeah, that dot points probably stream of consciousness, let's go to the next one. So if you um, are going to keep them, you can have a planned alteration to the analysis plan, uh, like go to a non-parametric method, a robust method, recode the variable, uh, just do a sensitivity analysis. Um, if you're going to remove it, this does simplify analysis, but it can lead to type one error inflation. Um, and it means that uh, you can no longer look at extreme values of your response. And this might actually be something that's interesting to you. Uh, if you've peeked at your research question data already, I would advise that you run a sensitivity analysis and report the results um, if you have outliers. Uh, so with high leverage points, um, keep or remove. I'm more okay with removing high leverage points than just outliers of the response um, because you might decide that you're just gonna remove that area of the covariates from your um, population. In some cases that might make sense because you don't have enough data to draw robust conclusions about them. Um, or you could even have a plan to go and collect more data to fill in, to fill in that um, space so that you can draw conclusions. Um, so, um, yeah, you could try transformations, as I've said, um, and you could just plan to do a sensitivity analysis where you check for influence and report the result, the sensitivity. Um, and there are some robust estimation methods. Uh, like it depends on what your analysis is, whether there's a ready-made robust method for your analysis or not. And yeah, if you've peeked at your research data question, keep them and just run a sensitivity analysis. Um, yeah, so another thing you might check for in initial data analysis is multicollinearity. So um, yeah, I really like the idea of um, having a plan for this a priori rather than just making it up on the fly. Uh, so when multicollinearity is when you've got um, two or more of your independent variables that are closely related. Um, and this can really stuff up your regression coefficients and you can get really big standard errors. So, um, uh, so you can start by looking at correlation matrices. Um, you can look, there's, um, there's ways to check for multicollinearity without touching the response variable. Uh, one method is called the tolerance, which is where you take each variable and you um, regress them against all your other variables, except for your response variable. And then you get, um, you look at the proportion of the variance explained and um, there's um, thresholds which you, at which you might say, if it's greater than this, I'm gonna um, say that that variable is too much a function of the other variables that I've already got. Um, and you can also look at variance inflation factors. These ones can only be looked at once you've fitted a model. So um, you can get, only get to them after you've looked at your research question, but that's also okay to have as part of your plan. Uh, so there's a ton of different um, diagnostics um, that you might pick from. Uh, and you just wanna think about what you're going to do if it turns out that 
income and um, something else in your data set are really correlated, you might already know, I'm just gonna get rid of that one. Um, so why not put it out there? Uh, and yeah, there's th these are options that you could have if you find it. You could omit variables, you could use dimension reduction, you could use um, some more tolerant methods uh, like penalized regression, lasso and ridge. Uh, yeah, it's, it's there, there's different options. Um, and since variable inclusion can have a big effect on your results, um, it's really good to pre-specify what you're gonna do about finding out that having this set of variables together in the model is gonna cause like big problems for estimating the model. And, um, and if you've got your plan, then you know that the decisions you're making are objective. Uh, yeah, and the last one is model assumptions. So really um, you should have a plan for what you're gonna do if the model assumptions aren't met. Um, and uh, yeah, it, yeah, this is just um, like, what if the var variable is not normal? Um, yeah, just realizing that you might come up with a plan before you collect your data, but you might have to make alterations to that plan. Uh, so that's my last point is that you should be aware that the analysis you choose for inference can be dependent on what you find out in the initial data analysis. And I guess that's where I'm sort of coming at this talk from because sometimes uh, we write something down when we talk to someone about collecting their data, about what they might do. And then later on, we discover more things that we, we didn't think about um, and, and that come up in the initial data analysis. And how can we, um, start to think about some of those things um, earlier so that the entire research uh, like progression happens in a, a rigorous way. Uh, so these are some principles to abide by um, that are in this uh, paper. 10 simple rules for initial data analysis. Have a plan budget the resources for it because it will take time. Um, and I'm sure I'm not um, telling anyone anything new, but yeah, it, it does, it will chew up lots of time. <laughs> um, uh, make it reproducible. Um, so this, the reproducibility of the initial data analysis is um, just as, it, as important as your um, inference, uh, even though you might not publish all of it, um, like you don't want to touch, you don't want to be making changes to your source data if possible. Um, I guess unless, yeah, there might be some cases where that's appropriate, but ideally um, all these changes that you make, you want to be able to always go back to the beginning and, and make them again. Um, so if you transform a variable, don't go into your Excel sheet and log transform it, just um, do it somewhere else. Uh, avoid sneak peeks at your research question. Um, sometimes it cannot be avoided, but um, keep that for the end. Um, do use data visualization, like plots are really good, um, as long as they're not plots that peak at your research question. Um, and do check for missing data and communicate your initial data analysis findings and consider the consequences of the steps you've taken. Uh, because it, they are um, like all decisions that might change the results. So they're appropriate things to talk about um, in the methods. Uh, yeah. Um, so I feel like I have um, used up my time. I, I 
finished with an example where I just like made up an initial data analysis plan because I've actually never done one either. Um, thought about what I might do. Uh, so I'll just talk through it in like a minute uh, where this example was like a study to relate um, NAPLAN uh, results to the amount of access to Chromebooks in the classroom. Um, and so got this grand plan, gonna do a mixed model relating the NAPLAN scores to the Chromebooks per student. I'll have a random effects for class and school, and I'm gonna get some covariates for known confounders like um, SES, like social economic status variables that I can get from um, ABS and maybe something else that I'm going to ask the school. Um, so uh, in my plan, um, I'm going to start by doing some data cleaning. I'm going to make sure I don't get any duplicates in the data joining process. I'm going to do plots of all the variables. And if I find any data errors, I'm going to go back to the source data and try and fix them. Then uh, I'm going to remove anything that remains. That's an error. Uh, and then I'm going to remove uh, from consideration any confounders that have minimal variation in my sample. So if I find that all the schools I've got have like the same social economic status, just going to chuck that variable out. Um, now, um, if I have less than 1% of my data missing completely, at, at missing at random, um, just going to do a complete case analysis. Uh, that's my plan. And if it's less than 5% of the data missing completely at random, I reckon my sample size is going to be sufficient, that my power will be okay, uh, the validity is okay, so I'm just going to do complete case analysis. That's, that's my plan. Um, otherwise, I'm going to do uh, rigorous missing data analysis with multiple imputation. I should probably have some more detail there. I'm going to log transform the, all of those variables, like the number of Chromebooks, um, SES variables, they have the potential to be skewed. So um, I'm going to have a look at that, see if, I, if they need to be made more symmetric to remove outliers. Um, uh, and uh, if there's any legitimate outliers, I'm going to keep them and for, fit a robust linear mixed model instead of a linear mixed model, because um, there's a package that does it, so it, it works for me. Um, and uh, I'm going to look at the SES variables and check the correlation between them, because I've got two confounders. And if they're correlated, I only need one of them. So my plan is just to check that. Um, and if they're not, then I'll keep both of them. Uh, and I've also suggested how I might choose them, which is a bit naughty, but it's not actually looking at my research question because they're just confounders. Um, and yeah, and then, I don't know, I just tried to think through all the things that come up um, and then all the decisions you end up making on the fly, like the linearity assumptions not satisfied, what am I gonna do then? Um, homoscedasticity assumption is violated, what am I gonna do then? Uh, it's schools and they're located in space. So I might have spatial autocorrelation. So I'm gonna look for that in the residuals. Um, check that the independence assumption is satisfied uh, and basically have a plan for all of the things that I think could go wrong. And then I know that I've, once I look at my research question, that I, it'll just be really easy. Hopefully that package works. Uh, <laughs> it does robust geo, linear mixed models. And um, yeah, that's it. So um, that's uh, the end of my talk. Um, thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> no.
partner uh, what the uh, yeah is there any questions uh, so um, Jennifer thank you um, has asked in the initial data in the data analysis journey where are the best occasions to stop and formally revise the original analysis plan before getting to the final analysis? That's a great question. Uh, so I, I think, so I'm just going back to um, this, this, um, this one. Um, yeah, my feeling is that you can do it multiple times um, because you may have to do initial data analysis multiple. I'm just trying to think whether any of those problems like iterate on themselves. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I don't know, actually, but I, probably at the end of all of the checks, but before the ones where you look at the model um, would be a great place to update the plan. Um, if um, you feel like you update the plan. Yeah, I can't actually see. So once you update the plan, you don't need to go back and do any more checks. So yeah, so that's that works. Sorry, that's not a very conclusive answer. Does anyone else at Stat Central have a good answer? Yes, I think you're basically I agree with yeah. you. I think you could imagine a situation where after doing your initial data analysis, you want to change a plan, but you would like to change maybe to an analysis that comes with some assumptions that you didn't have before. And then and you have to you go and then check. might want to check those before you commit to that particular analysis. I yeah. Guess. So what Peter just said, because the audio probably didn't come through, is that uh, you might um, change your statistical analysis plan to something that has um, assumptions that you didn't need to check before. And so you then need to um, layer those checks into your new analysis plan. And then that might generate another iteration <laughs> of your analysis plan. Um, yeah, I think um, I imagine that in practice, uh, as you find things, um, you'll just be that, yeah, that the things that don't depend on each other will just be sort of all done in one block at the end of your data screening. Um, yeah, and yeah, so there's, um, there's obviously like a lot to know in there as well. Mo like some of that stuff, most of us would have to do fair bit of uh, Google scholaring on, on some of those topics. So um, yeah, so, but the general principles of what things to think about and then what you might go and uh, research on how to, um, how you're gonna address that particular problem. Um, even unforeseen problems may be a <laughs> part of your plan. <laughs> uh, like that, that, you know, an unforeseen problem is also a reason to update your statistical analysis plan. And you should um, aim to identify the unforeseen problem before you touch your research question, is what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I hope that um, inspires you. Uh, I certainly got inspired by researching this talk. I was like, oh, it's so rigorous. <laughs> this science is so rigorous. Uh, yeah, because I think, yeah, it's uh, a lot of things to think about 
before you get excited about your research question. Um, and that's very, very hard. So another question. Uh, what do you think will motivate to do more IDA reporting? Hi, Emmy. <laughs> Uh, this talk, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I don't know that one of those papers is a 2022 paper. Um, so um, probably um, having it as a requirement of pre-registration uh, or like, yeah, having it as seen to be good practice in uh, pre-registration uh, would um, would help. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, if there is no more questions, uh, I'll thank everyone for coming and uh, I'll see you at our next seminar. <laughs>